Welcome to Doctors on Call, I'm Jenna Miller. Cervical cancer is the fourth most common type of cancer among women in the world. This cancer is most frequently di diagnosed among women ages 35 to 44, and reports have found no strong evidence linking any aspect of food, nutrition, and physical activity to the risk of this cancer. But women who smoke are twice as likely to develop cervical cancer as those who don't. What are some other risk factors and how can you lower the risk of this cancer? Cervical cancer is our topic tonight on Doctors on Call with our desk guest, Dr. Perez Tamayo of Central Care Cancer Center. Presentation of Doctors on Call on Smoky Hills PBS is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from Hutchinson Regional Healthcare System, our family caring for yours. At Osborne County Memorial Hospital, our services range from clinic visits to inpatient and skilled care, but our specialty is you. Your family is our family. The staff at Smith County Memorial Hospital wants to set the standard of excellence for health care in North Central Kansas. Dr. Perez Tamayo is a radiation oncologist and president of Central Care Cancer Center. Dr. Perez Tamayo completed her radiation oncology residency at the Medical College of Wisconsin. She was awarded prestigious fellowships to both the American College of Radiology and the American College of Radi Radiation Oncology for her contributions and service through education, research, and service activities in the practice of radiation oncology. Her academic appointments include the University of Michigan and the University of Kansas Medical Center. She participated with the American College of Radiology Commission on Small and Rural Practices, was appointed to the President's Cancer Panel, and is a part of the Kansas Comprehensive Can Cancer Control Panel. Dr. Perez Tamayo is board certified by the American Board of Radio Radiology and the American Board of Internal Medicine, subspecialty of hospice and palliative medicine. She has expertise in brain and body stereotactic procedures along with high dose rate brachytherapy. Dr. Perez Tamayo sees patients at Central Care's Great Bend, Emporia, and Kansas City locations, as well as Heartland Cancer Center in Garden City, and is a provider with Central Care cancer center. Give us a call at 800-337-4788 toll free with your questions about radiation oncology and cervical cancer today on Doctors on Call. Doctors on Call brings you information which may be useful to you when you see your own physician. Thank you so much for coming back and joining us. We got a lot to cover so let's get to it. First of all let's talk about what exactly is cervical cancer. Cancer of the cervix is actually the we call it dysplasia. It starts with dysplasia which is the uh, irritation of the lining of the cervix. And what is a cervix? Let's go through the anatomy. The, uh, if you can imagine a bottle upside down, the opening of the bottle would be the cervix. The cervix has a special lining, which with irritation, and usually 99% is due to a viral uh, component, becomes irritated to the point of cancer. So it usually is 99% of the time a squamous cell carcinoma, although there are other types of pathologies that are rarer. And this is a highly um, avoidable cancer, and that's why it's so sad to even see it, because with the vaccinations we have now, it, we can completely eradicate it before it even starts. Now we had mentioned in the open about women who smoke are more likely to get cervical cancer. Why is that? We don't know. That is, is still debated, frankly speaking. It could be that uh, there is some decrease in the immunologic system. There are some uh, predictions that there is this uh, endothelial growth factor that calls, that, that feeds the cancer due to the smoking. Uh, there's, there's a lot of work being done on that so that maybe that will become part of the treatment uh, of this cancer. And talk about some of the symptoms and signs. Well, usually it's silent when it first starts. Um, in fact, that's why pap smears are done because we don't know that you have it until with a pap smear, which is basically a, a very simple uh, smear that is obtained from your cervix through a pelvic exam. And then you see something called dysplasia or coelocytosis. And what that means is that you have the virus that produces cancer and then 
further uh, diagnosis happens. Now, when you start getting symptoms, which is bleeding, pain with intercourse, or even back pain or swelling of your legs, it's when it's already far advanced. Mm -hmm. And is it considered hereditary? Not really, although there is some tendency in the families of uh, people that have cancer of the cervix that you may be inclined to it, but it is, it is a venereal transmitted disease. And how, in your practice, what have you found are the causes of most of your cervical cancer cases? Well, it's primarily, there's 40 uh, types of uh, human papillomavirus that can produce this cancer. But the two most, prominent, uh, most prevalent ones, 16 and 18, are the ones that cause this cancer. And, and there is a Gardasil a vaccination which you can give your child, which will fight this, these uh, actually nine uh, prominent uh, viruses that produce 80 to 90% of the cancers before they even happen. So prevention is the best thing against this cancer from the very beginning. And let's talk about treatment. When, when a person is diagnosed, uh, how do you treat? Well, first of all, you see where the stage is. So you need to know, is the woman just has a pre-cancerous condition where there is minor cancer? How old is the person? Do they want to have children? Because sometimes a hysterectomy is enough. But then you have to you know, fold in, because this is, this is a cancer of young people. So you have to fold in where they are in their lives. Now, if we have later cancer, where there is even stage one can be what we call barrel-shaped, when it's just exactly like a barrel, the, the tumor is five centimeters or more, then you don't really have much of a choice. Even surgery is beyond, uh, the case is beyond surgery, even at stage one. So then we have chemotherapy and radiation as the only weapon against this cancer. But again, you have 99% chance of getting rid of it especially if it's between stage one and two. When we go in stage three, then we drop, that drops significantly. And what that means is that there's lymph nodes or involvement of the covering uh, of the parametra. And how does HPV cause the cancer? Well, HPV is the virus that first starts at the surface and goes into the basal, set, basal layer. Imagine that your skin and then it kind of pierces your skin into the layers, under layers of your skin, and starts making those uh, cells become dysplastic or abnormal. Instead of having your skin being normal and covering, it starts making the skin uneven and um, angry. Uh, even, for instance, false dentures can, can irritate your, your, your gums to the point of cancer. So now this virus continues to be uh, irritating and irritating to the point that the the orderly uh, squamous covering becomes toxic in a toxic environment and it becomes cancerous. Now, are there other symptoms to having the HPV virus besides the skin? No, but you, these days we e even can have, uh, the um, people can ask for uh, uh, HPV testing so you can know if you've been exposed to it. You can, you know, you can be married and be virginal but if your partner isn't a virgin as well, you're going to be exposed to HPV. Now, there's 20,000 uh, women exposed a year of, to HPV. Not all of them are malignant, uh, causing malignancies. But if you are sexually active, and even if both are very faithful, but if they've had other partners, basically you have the risk. And the risk is not only to the cervix, but it's to the vagina, the vulva, all the area, including the head, neck, even below your nails, your eyelids, everywhere where the mucosa is irritated. Okay, let's talk about your Early Detection Works program and how that works. Well, the Early Detection program is actually something sponsored by the, the, the state. And it's something that is provide, it provides for both cervical cancer and breast cancer a way of getting it diagnosed. And you have certain uh, guidelines that if you fall within those guidelines, you're able to submit uh, the possibility of getting this diagnosed um, through the different processes and even treated if you fit those qualifications. But it has to be within their limits. There is very specific 
uh, criteria. So if you have an abnormality by the pelvic exam, uh, it would be advisable for your primary care uh, physician or nurse practitioner to send the pa send the this this patient to us, for instance, so we can let them know what they can be covered through this program. Okay, let's talk about the cervical cancer screening options. Well, the screening is only pap smears, basically, and pelvic exams. Now, here is where I stand up, <clears throat> and I, please, women out there, make sure you request by name having a rectal exam with your pelvic exam. If you do not have a rectal exam, you cannot feel the ovaries or the parametria. The parametria is if you can imagine my body being the uterus and I put a sheet over my, my body and my arms are, outstand, uh, are uh, outstretched, this sheet would be the parametria. You cannot feel it if you don't do a rectal exam. Part of the pelvic exam must include a rectal exam or you have not had a good gynecological exam. And this is where the cancer of the cervix spreads. So to, to screen you, you need to have the pap smear, you need to look, which is a speculum exam, and then you need to do a bimanual exam with a rectum and a pelvic uh, exam. Okay, we wanna remind our viewers that we are talking about cervical cancer tonight with Dr. Perez Tamayo. Give us a call at 1-800-337-4788 if you have a question. Now, going back to the Early Detection Works program, let's talk about enrollment. Is that a big deal? Is it very easy? Let's well, talk about Well, it's that. very easy if you are um, savvy with the computer. It's, it's sometimes not very easy, and sometimes you just need to go to the um, to the uh, your own the, your own primary care physician, and they have this available, and they can guide you through it. We have it as a standard in in all our centers, so it's a matter of just making an appointment and getting the information, or we can guide you through it. We often do this with many cancers, where we are um, basically we have a computer there, and we assist the patient. Uh, enrolling themselves and, and asking, you know, and answering the questions that sometimes are hard to understand. So we are more than happy to assist. Sure, and if a person unfortunately gets denied, where do they go from there? Well, unless they, they don't fit the criteria, um, it would be hard to deny it, but we have actually grants, we have significant amount of money that we ask for throughout the country. This is not federal or state grants, about $30 million, where we can apply to people that don't have insurance or have insurance that doesn't cover things. So you may be able to fit one of these grants. And again, many of the people that make these grants available have criteria. So we are able to say, okay, if you may fit this grant that is given by this uh, person or company or, or this grant. So we're able to help patients in this manner. Now, do you find women tend to be uh, reluctant to get screened early? Yes, and that's why the, this, this free to know program or this uh, early detections program is so important because sometimes they're embarrassed or you know, they feel that their, their significant other may be um, a problem even though the, it may not happen, but in their heads that's what it is. So going through the, may say the back door, maybe the way to get help and so um, embarrassment, in fact, is a concern. That's why I always feel that if you don't feel that the exam was sufficient or you are having symptoms you don't understand, it's easy to call one of our doctors in any of the centers and we can answer it for you and we can say, okay, this is what I would ask your doctor or this is the next step. Okay, what um, should you do following an abnormal pap test? Well, the abnormal pap smear, actually the first person in line would be the gynecologist. They would stage you and they would stage one, two, three, or four. Stage one means it's still within the cervix and nowhere else. Stage two meaning it is involving the surrounding the, the area of the cervix but not the parametria. And stage three means that you have parametria involvement, those, the wing that I talked to you about. And stage four it means it's gone into the bone or other distant sites. Um, you are still curable even with stage three disease. So you need to, um, the, you know, the, the, the gynecologist, and usually it's a specialist, a 
a gynecologist oncologist will guide the patient to what would be the best for the individual stage. Most patients, I would say the majority, fall into the chemotherapy radiation arm. And that would include external radiation, which means that radiation given from above with a linear accelerator, and brachytherapy, which means that we put inside a special apparatus that gives you radiation just to the cervix. Brachytherapy means short distance therapy along with chemotherapy at the same time. And this again is why Central Care Cancer Center is a perfect situation because we have both medical oncology and radiation at the same site. So you don't have to be traveling around to get different portions of this. Surgery is reserved for the very early cases. And, and sometimes they are so early that something called a cone is enough, meaning they take away uh, just a cone of the cervix and that's all. Especially if a woman wants to have children and, and they want to keep the ovaries until that happens. How often do you use the brachytherapy? Always. Mm -hmm. You always use uh, brachytherapy for the treatment of cancer of the cervix. Okay. So what are some ways, or are there any ways, to reduce your risk of the gynecological uh, cancer? Well, number one is to start early with your uh, uh, vaccinations, and the vaccinations are recommended from age basically 9 to 26. Now they're actually going all the way to 40, and you really want to use this because you want to give them before person, people are sexually active. The vaccinations only work for the viruses that you have not been exposed to. So if you're above that and you have been sexually active, I don't know how uh, significant of an impact it's going to be for you unless you have some sort of immune compromise uh, situation like you have some rheumatic condition or something that would make you unable to fight a virus. But the, the, to give the, this vaccination before sexual uh, uh, contact is, is primarily, and it's for both boys and girls, not just girls, both. And this will uh, provide 90% coverage. You will never see this again. So why would you not want to have your child vaccinated? Sometimes that is one of the dilemmas. There is some kind of thought process where in my, in my you know, saying promiscuity is, is, is what I am um, providing by letting a child get a vaccination. And the reality is no, we're, we're just providing a way of preventing a, a disease that could cause that person a loss of life and definitely loss of children. So I would think that one would want to prevent it. Are there any foods that a person should limit or consume to stay, um, to lower the risk of cancer? No, well, the risk of cancer in general, uh, there are, of course, uh, hormonally driven cancers. This is not one of them, like breast cancer. Any, any cancer that's, that is estrogen driven, yes, you know, you don't want to eat estrogen in any form because it's going to make it increase. Now, growth hormones are another matter. As I said from the beginning, there's something called endothelial factors or angiogenesis, which anything that's going to make more blood vessels and, and supply that to the cancer is going to make the cancer grow faster and richer and, and happier. And what those are are growth hormones. And growth hormones are actually things you find in some of the foods that are not hormonally raised, I mean organically raised. So if you're eating um, meat that has hormonal growth factors, like if you see a chicken this big, you know, little chick, and then all of a sudden it's huge just to sell it faster, it's not the normal way a chick grows, and that has uh, growth ho uh, hormones, um, growth factors. And that includes shrimp and anything that's ranched. So if you don't have wild food, organically grown foods, you're going to be at risk of consuming these growth factors. And you mentioned estrogen. Uh, what about progesterone? Is it important? It's the same thing. Estrogen progesterone receptors are uh, not, they not have a, a role heal here. It's mostly for the breast cancer and other hormonally manipulated cancers. And what are your thoughts, going back to diet, what are your thoughts? You mentioned the meat. How does a plant-based diet work out? The plant-based diet is equally as, as, as dangerous if, you, if, you're, if you're eating things that have like Roundup or any kind of organic solvent. So if you don't have organic grown vegetables and fruits, you're just in the same problem. So you need to eat healthy 
uh, you need to eat, and meat is not bad, meat is good, but you need to eat it so that you don't have this growth uh, factors in it uh, or extra estrogen that you don't need. Uh, the same thing goes for fruits and vegetables. You don't need them to have this. Um, and that goes for water. Water has a lot of um, organic solvents that have been left from the DDT days. And we don't use that anymore. But where do they go? They go where, where there's fat. And where is there fat? Well, in the breast and in the ovaries. So you want to avoid eating things that are going to give you cancers in those places. In fact, that's what they found the DDTs would cause birds not to be able to have eggs because they would go to the ovaries or the place where the birds would be conceiving. So anything that is an organic solvent, organic doesn't mean that it's good, it means that it is found, uh, it's a, a solvent that is um, produced um, and it is like Roundup for instance, it's, it would be something you don't want in your water. Okay, when you have a patient come in and they've done all the tests and they do have cancer, what's the next step? Well, as I said, the staging is number one. Deciding what to do is number two, depending on the variables, and then proceed with it. The chances of cure is very high. The, the cancer, I mean, the treatment is very easy, it produces very little side effects, and it's over. And then you can proceed on your way. Um, you know, there are some questions, can I get reinfected? There's a lot of questions that are not answered yet. Nobody can, nobody can tell you. Uh, it, is, it, it is mentally, I mean, psychologically, it is devastating to the, to the partnership because you have, this is something that you both share. So what, you know, what other things are at risk once you have cancer of the cervix? So there are other, th other sequelae that need to be followed. Sure, you mentioned the side effects and that they're minimal, but what can they be? Well, for instance, um, for surgery, you know, if the surgery is a radical hysterectomy, you can have fistulas, which means con abnormal connections. You can have all kinds of adhesions. But these days, those are not seen very much anymore. Uh, the, uh, the types of surgeries that are done are very almost, you know, and some of them can be robotic. It's really very um, minimally uh, as to the sequela. The radiation chemotherapy are done with uh, in, uh, image guided. Radiation means that you can see all the organs as you're treating, and so you avoid things you don't have to treat. And the chemotherapy is very targeted. So um, yes, of course, you can be one of those rare birds that uh, can have a, an abnormal uh, side effect, which can include you know, ongoing diarrhea, rectal irritation, uh, fibrosis, um, you know, things of this nature. We don't see that very often. And depending on the stage, how many treatments can a person uh, for radiation expect? Usually for the radiation is a 25-day affair uh, with then the brachytherapy, which can be anywhere between three to five sessions. These are done under anesthesia. And usually it can be high dose rate, not always. Some, in some places, like in MD Anderson, they do low dose rate, which is a two-day course. Um, both are equally as effective. The chemotherapy is given simultaneously with the radiation, the external portion. So that's usually the, the expected course. Some, some cancers can be treated with, with brachytherapy alone. But that's not very common. And what about immunotherapy? Well, there are some immunotherapeutic agents that are not being um, uh, offered. And, but these are for people that have failed the standard treatment. So it's not something that is the first line at this time. Okay, all right, great. Thank you so much to Dr. Perez Tamayo for Thank being you. our guest tonight on Doctors on Call. Despite the benefits of having cervical cancer screening, not all American women get screened. Most cervical cancers are found in women who have never had a pap test or who have not had one recently. There's assistance in Kansas through the Early Detection Works program that we talked about earlier. For more information, you can click on that uh, website that is on your screen. Thank you again uh, for our next Doctors on Call. We'll be talking about home health care. You can email questions to us at doctors at shptv.org. Thank you for joining us for Doctors on Call. I'm Jenna Miller.
presentation of Doctors on Call on Smoky Hills PBS is made possible in part by an underwriting grant from Hutchinson Regional Healthcare System. Our family caring for yours. At Osborne County Memorial Hospital, our services range from clinic visits to inpatient and skilled care, but our specialty is you. Your family is our family. The staff at Smith County Memorial Hospital wants to set the standard of excellence for health care in North Central Kansas. Coastal Regional Hospital, experts, neighbors, friends.